that story about connecting the dots that is just so amazing and I guess um, often a process we go through in science too that um, science will often start with a, a question and not always sure where it's going to lead uh, and uh, not until years later we can look back and connect the dots so this is um, yeah, switching gears a bit to science that um, uh, I do research on human brain so human brain this beautiful complex organ that we all have in our head. Um, and in preparing this talk today, um, I watched the uh, TED talk by Jill Bolte Taylor, an incredible talk, uh, one of the most watched presentation, TED presentations of all time. Uh, and she came out in her talk holding human brain in her hands, a real actual human brain, spinal cord dangling down, everything, which is just amazing to see. That um, me and my research, I deal with uh, brains, um, see brains every day, but um, through MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so it's very rare that I get the chance to see physically a human brain um, or let alone hold one in my hands. Um, but um, MRI gives us a really fantastic tool for investigating function of the living human brain. So this is the sort of work I do at Queensland Brain Institute. This is some of my lab group. Uh, we do things like um, recording electrical activity of the brain directly with EEG um, or putting people inside the MRI scanner. Uh, in, with MRI, we can have people do tasks while they're inside the scanner and measure the changes in blood flow that accompany changes in brain activity um, as people do particular tasks in the scanner. And what I'm going to tell you about today, uh, the focus of a lot of my research is on imitation. So this is a wordle from the Wikipedia page for imitation. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about imitation, how we come to understand others' actions, intentions, goals, emotions, even, through a process of, kind of simulation or mirroring uh, with the other person. And so this revolves around imitation. Imitation is an incredibly important um, ability for us as humans. Um, anyone with children will see this very much in their children. Uh, they learn a lot through imitation. Um, it also has a really important social function that um, we tend to imitate people we like and we tend to like people who imitate us. Uh, it sounds weird, but so not in a really creepy way. <laughs> if, <laughs> if imitation's too close, it, it really freaks us out, right? But, um, but subconsciously, we mimic facial expressions and gestures, body language of people we're connecting with socially. Mm -hmm. um, and we've known long this uh, natural tendency we have to imitate. Um, Charles Darwin wrote about this in his famous work on the emotions of man and animals. Um, and um, the idea that uh, this tendency to imitate we have is independent of the conscious will. It's just something we, we automatically do. And we go on to the next slide. We see this really clearly uh, in my cheap party trick here. Of when we see a picture like this, we really have to fight that urge to yawn ourselves, right? Um, so this comes together in a psychological theory known as simulation. Simulation theory has been around for decades. Um, that we understand others' intentions, um, or mental and emotional states and intentions by simulating their state in our own mind. So in a sense, we, we put ourselves in their shoes. So for example, how do we know what she is experiencing in this picture? That, you know, as humans, we're very logical, rational, often, uh, beings. We like to theorize and make up reasons for things. Um, maybe we understand her state by, um, well, we've had injections in the past. We know they're painful. She's having an injection, she must be feeling pain, right? Um, simulation theory is, really proposes the opposite, that when we see a picture like that, our first response is, ouch. Right? We feel a little of her pain, that we simulate or emulate her mental state in our own mind. Uh, so that's all specified in terms of the mind, so we, we simulate others' mental states in our own mind. How might the brain do this? What might be going on in the brain that gives rise to um, us sharing others' experiences? Um, is it the case that we actually mirror others' brain activity in our own brain? Uh, and neuroscience currently says, yes, that seems to be what happens. Uh, so it's into this background that 
Professor Giacomo Rizzolati through the, in the 1990s, um, came up with this discovery of mirror neurons. So these are um, neurons that, that really provide a plausible neuronal mechanism for how we simulate others' states in our own brain. So his group was very famous through the 80s and 90s uh, for putting deep electrodes into the brain in the motor areas in the monkey uh, and very carefully recording and uh, documenting um, what motor areas uh, in the monkey, um, what neurons in these motor areas would respond to as monkeys were grasping, performing precision grasps and different kinds of actions. And in a typical experiment, what they'd do, the monkey would grasp a nut, and then the, the handler, the experimenter there, would take a nut and put it back in front of the monkey, it would grasp again. And what they noticed, um, surprisingly, uh, when they were recording from some neurons, that some of these neurons would fire as well, they'd become active, uh, when the experimenter picked up a nut to put back in front of the monkey. And they thought, oh, this was very interesting, uh, unusual, interesting. They started to investigate those neurons in much more detail and then came out with this discovery of mirror neurons. So these are neurons that fire when the monkey performs an action, such as this precision grip, uh, and also when the monkey uh, observes that same action being performed. So essentially, they're neurons that mirror the behavior of the observed person in the monkey's own brain. And... Rizzolatti put this together in a theory of action perception called direct matching, that um, we understand others' actions when we map the visual representation of those actions to equivalent motor uh, representations of the same action. So we know very well in the, the motor system of the human brain, before we perform any voluntary action, we make a kind of a program for that action and it's stored in... The, in um, neurons in the motor areas of the brain. Uh, and if we're just imagining movement or preparing to perform a movement, we have that same plan. And it now seems that uh, if we're observing others' actions, we also have that same plan for action in our own brain. So observing action, uh, visual stimuli get processed in the occipital lobes at the back of the brain, uh, and via mirror neurons, uh, it seems that this is mapped to an equivalent motor plan for that action, as if we were to perform that action ourselves. So, um, one crucial thing about a system like this is that processing of the observed action must be highly automatic. That, you know, our tendency to imitate is automatic. The brain must be processing observed actions in a kind of subconscious or very automatic way. And, in cognitive neuroscience, we have a really nice technique for uh, examining kind of unconscious processing in the brain, uh, known as binocular rivalry. And anyone interested in subliminal advertising, this is a really good technique, uh, especially with 3D televisions that are out nowadays. You can do this very easily. Um, with binocular rivalry, we present different images to each eye. So we present a picture of a hand gesture to one eye and high contrast flashing dots to the other eye, people never see the hand gesture. All they consciously perceive is the flashing dots. But nonetheless, that hand gesture um, the signals that the image of the hand gesture reaches the um, neurons in the primary visual cortex at the back of the brain. Um, and using MRI, uh, we can measure how far through the brain, through visual processing, um, it does this um, unseen picture of the hand proceed. Mm. In, a, in a subliminal, subconscious way. Uh, so when we do that, um, first of all, when, we, when hand gestures are completely visible, we see activation in what we call the human mirror neuron system. Uh, so these are parts of the brain that contain mirror neurons in the monkeys, uh, parts of the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. Uh, but also when the hand gestures are invisible, so they're suppressed from conscious perception, people never, are never aware of seeing a hand gesture, there's still parts of the parietal lobe that are engaged and processing those hand gestures subconsciously uh, and perhaps having an influence on our behaviour. Uh, so this does seem to be a very automatic system we have in the brain for processing observed actions. OK. So all of that is action-related, because that's what's being studied in the monkeys. Um, but we do think a similar mirroring 
uh, process um, exists also for emotions, for understanding others' emotions and empathy, things like touch and pain. These are things that are very difficult to study, measuring from single neurons in a, in a monkey, obviously. Um, but we think the same mechanisms exist um, for emotions. And one of the really seminal pieces of work in this area um, is from uh, Tanya Singer in London, where they brought in male-female couples um, into the MRI, uh, and they put the women in the scanner, because they thought the women will be, have more empathy than the men will. Um, and the women in the scanner, uh, they received a small electric shock to the back of their hand, and some mild pain, and also they observed their male partner getting the same pain on the back of their hand. And what they found is very interesting, that pain has these two components that are, seem to be processed quite differently in the brain. So one is basically the sensory perception of that, the same as any other kind of touch. Um, the primary sensory areas of the brain, um, they become active. Um, so here in green, um, when the women uh, experience the pain, sensory areas of the brain are responding, but not when they're observing their partner in pain. Um, on the other hand, there's a strong emotional component to pain. Pain's unpleasant, right? Um, so the emotional response to pain uh, was equivalent uh, in the women when they received pain and when they were observing their partner in pain. Um, so from this, it does seem that we emulate, um, empathise, um, in a way that our brain has a very similar response to pain, um, whether it's felt ourselves or observed in others, in this case, others we love. Um, I might say that this is um, the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain, which is a really important area for emotion processing. So this work's been extended in quite controversial ways. Um, and this is a study done quite recently in Beijing, where uh, they had people in the MRI scanner watching others of either the same race or a different race, uh, receiving a painful needle prick in the cheek uh, or touch with a cotton tip, so a painful or non-painful touch. And again, they're looking for activation in the anterior cingulate cortex, so this area that's, that's um, um, very important for emotion processing. And what they found is when people were watching others of the same race, there's a very strong response in the anterior cingulate cortex to that empathic pain. Um, but surprisingly, when people are watching others of a different race, there was no brain response at all. Uh, so this is kind of shocking that um, they say from this, we actually don't have any empathic response to seeing people of another race in pain. Um, so I don't believe this. I don't want to believe this. Um, and there are other reasons for this. So, um, so this is the kind of work that follow up in, in my lab currently, that we don't believe that it's about race at all. Um, there are many, many ways that we associate with a group, with one group and not with another group. And race is one, race is along one, one dimension. But we know that empathic responses are much stronger when we're seeing people of our own family, our own group, the singer study, our, our loved ones. Um, and um, so what we do is we bring people into the lab and we join them up to a team. We introduce them to their teammates that are a mixed race group and we introduce them to a bunch of opponents that are a mixed race group uh, and put them in the scanner. We have the same kind of nasty videos of a needle touching cheek. Um, and again, looking for activity in the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and with this, we um, can see if just the group effect belonging to one group versus another is stronger than race. Um, that uh, we don't actually have a biological reason to be racist, if you like, that this effect is not due to race per se. So I don't have any results to show you. This is work in progress, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's the nature of science. We'll join the dots. <laughs> later on. Um, but this is the direction that social neuroscience type work is going, which is very interesting. So, uh, I go on to the next. I want to finish uh, with something about technology, telling you where MRI research is going, um, that 
um, there's been in incredible um, advances in neuroscience research in the last decade, and this is just continuing to accelerate with new technology. It's fantastic. Um, so last year, I had the great pleasure to spend four months in Vienna. Vienna known for music and Mozart and big magnets, apparently. Um, <laughs> So this is a seven Tesla MRI scanner. This is uh, almost twice as strong as any human MRI scanner we have in Australia currently. But we're getting one of these in Brisbane by the end of next year at University of Queensland. It's very exciting. So um, with high field, uh, we can get much higher resolution of the brain. So we can see things we've never been able to see before. And what this means is, so for me, I'm interested in control of movement uh, and some of these motor circuits that are very deep in the brain, structures like the basal ganglia and thalamus. Now, these are areas that are critically important for movement, and they're the main areas that are functioning abnormally in people with Parkinson's disease. And uh, it's been very hard in living human brain to, to measure function through these circuits. And this is kind of the typical state of the art nowadays of large blobs through that area. But with high field, high resolution MRI, we can really start to trace out activation through quite specific nuclei in these structures and just see detail of the, the functioning human brain um, like we never have been able to before. So this is very exciting. This is the future for MRI. So finish again with, um, well, this is not literally a brain. Uh, it's a, picture from MRI, it is the real brain of a person who's living and out there walking around today, uh, and it's, uh, MRI just gives us this exquisite tool for examining function in the, in the living human brain. Thank you. <laughs>